Hey there, it's Raimu. Welcome to part three of my introduction to Rust series. In this video, we're going to tackle data types. So let's start off by defining what we mean. So data, in this case, values, information. A type is an attribute that we associate with data that determines how that data is interpreted. Rust handles a lot of different data types. So let's get started by making a new project. We're going to go out and do a cargo new part three. And we're going to go open our new part three folder. And again, we're presented with our default template. So before I get into the details, let me just say that Rust is a statically typed language. You're gonna run into a lot of other programming languages out there. Some of them will be statically typed, some will be dynamically typed. When it comes down to it, the differences are statically typed languages like Rust are languages where the type is required to be known by the compiler when it compiles your program. So again, compiling is when it takes the source code that we write and turns it into a program that you can run. Other languages that support dynamic typing, for example, the compiler doesn't need to know the exact type of all values until the program is actually running. So again, Rust is a statically typed language. Now we'll run into a few things in future videos where it kind of stretches the envelope with that definition. But in most cases, if it's safe to say that when Rust compiles your program, it needs to know the type of every value in it. So let's get down to it. What are the different types we can use in Rust? Let's take our example program here, and instead of just printing hello world, let's have it do something useful. We'll say something times something else equals something else. So we'll do like a computation of some kind. And again, the syntax of printing, it's hard to go through all of it early on in this series. We'll explain more of it later, but suffice to say, it's like you would intuitively think. These braces are going to be replaced with values that we list. So let's just come up with some names like X and Y and XY. As if we were doing some kind of math problem, we we're taking two numbers and multiplying them and getting the answer and printing all of that out, right? So the first thing we run into is that Rust doesn't know what X is. It can't find that value in our program. So the way you introduce values in Rust is to bind names to them. And that you do with the let keyword. So you'd say let x and then give it a value like 42. Let's do the same with y. Let's say y is negative 69. All right, so how do we get xy? If conceptually we want xy to be x multiplied by y, I need to introduce another concept here. We already know that we can bind xy to something, but how do we do multiplication here? This in Rust, like in a lot of other programming languages, is done through something called an expression. Basically, you can take other values, either constants or other values, otherwise known as variables that you have in your program, and construct expressions like you would in math. So here we have xy bound to the expression x multiplied by y. So let's cargo run this. We'll see it does what we expect. 42 times negative 69 is negative 2,898. Great. So how does Rust see this in the form of types? And let me introduce another command that we can do. If we go to the command palette, we type inlay, you see that there is a Rust analyzer toggle inlay hints. So this gives us a little bit of internal inspection of what Rust thinks of when it sees our program. And it introduces this concept of a type. So the value x, which is assigned the quantity 42, has a type of i32. If we wanted to, we could force Rust to call this an i32 simply by typing that. So now instead of it being an inlay hint or an inspection of what Rust thinks of when it sees that value in that type, we're actually forcing it to be that type. Now, I32 stands for 32-bit signed integer. An integer from math being a whole number, could be positive or negative. 32-bit meaning that internally the computer will use 32 bits of information to store the number. A couple things we could do here. We could say that instead of it being 32 bits, we can expand it to 64 bits. And you can see that Rust is pretty smart about changing the types of the variables that we didn't force a type for. So to be 
compatible with our X, which is a 64-bit integer, it had to make Y and the product of X times Y into integer 64-bit as well. So in addition to signed integers, there's also the unsigned integers. If I force X to be instead of I64, U64, a 64-bit unsigned, this means the number can't be negative. All 64 bits go into the quantity, whereas if it was signed, you'd have 63 bits going into the quantity and then one bit left over for picking the difference between negative and positive. So you see we run into a problem here. Rust doesn't know how to make negative 64 fit into the types that are required to make the rest of the program work. One way to fix this is knowing that we're going to be dealing with signed numbers, we could take X here and do what we call a type cast, which is to tell Rust, take this value and change its type to I64. You do that with as. You might have seen this keyword before. I used it to do aliasing in the past. When it's used with values, as is changing the type. Now that we've gotten a little bit of taste about integer types and different bit sizes and signed versus unsigned, Let's throw something else into the mix. Let's say we want to use non-integer types, real numbers, with decimal points and all that good stuff. So as you can see, if I introduce that right away, it's going to complain because it says you can't put a floating point number, which is Rust's notion of a non-integer real number, into a U64. So if we just remove this type and this typecast, we still have a problem because it figured out that X is an F64 or floating point 64 bit value, but it still doesn't know how to multiply them because Russ is very picky about the types. There are two ways we could fix this. We could either add a decimal point to Y and there it figures out that they're all 64 bit floating values, or we could simply for the Y, we can say as F64. Here's another trick you can do. If you knew you didn't need 64 bits, you could, cast the y to f32 and then that causes the compiler to make x also 32-bit okay and that's essentially it for basic numbers let's introduce another kind of type let's say we wanted to have the program tell us whether or not x times y is positive we would have something like this conceptually we would say is xy positive and then we'll have some kind of answer so we'll put xy and then have xy is positive so the concept of truth and falsehood, whether something is true or false, is called a Boolean. We can define x, y as positive in terms of an expression which generates a Boolean value, true or false. So is x, y greater than zero? You can see that the inlay hint tells us that it is a bool or Boolean value. So if I run this, it is not positive, false. So booleans are going to come up later in future videos when we talk about control flow. But for now, just think of it as if a condition is true or false. Now the last simple type that Rust deals with is called the character. So what is a character? You've already seen a few of them. All of these are characters. Let's have an explicit character. We'll have something print something like, my favorite character is something, and we'll have favorite. The way you declare a value of type single character is using single quotes. So we would put something like X. X is kind of boring. Let's use something more interesting. I'm going to pull in the Black Floret character. So as you can see, Rust handles not just ASCII characters, A through Z numbers, but it supports all characters from all character sets out there, including emojis, characters from other languages like Chinese, Japanese, anything you might think of. Now internally, Rust handles values of the character type as four byte quantities, where a byte is eight bits, so four times eight, 32 bit quantities. And we can see that this is true if we say let favorite bits equal favorite as U32, and then we actually try to print that in bits is bits. Maybe we can say that the character code is 10,047. Another little trick that we'll cover in future videos is you can say, I want to format as hexadecimal and put a U plus in front. And we'll see it is the Unicode character U plus 273F, which if you look up on Google is the black floret character. Okay, enough about the simple types. Let's get into the more complicated types that we're going to be dealing with, especially in future videos. First one I want to talk about is the tuple. 
So let's say we want to have a single value which holds both of our numbers that we've been using before. So let's say x and y equals, this is how you define a tuple with parentheses. As you can see with our inlay hint, the tuple type is declared as the types of the individual members of that tuple with commas between them and parentheses on the outside. Now we could print out this tuple. The tuple is x and y. And I made a mistake here. So you can see in the compiler errors, if we use this syntax for printing, we'll be able to print it. Now, why we had to do that, we'll talk about in future videos. Suffice to say, this is telling it to print it using a debug formatter rather than a non-debug formatter. If we wanted to get access to an individual character, or let's, say, let's, one, let's say we wanted to get x out of that, we could say x and y and then a dot and then an index or a number which picks one or the other of the things in the tuple. So x would be index 0 and y would be index 1. So we can say here x is something and y is something else just to prove that this is doing what I said it would do. There you go. All right, that's a tuple. So let's do the same thing but with another type called the array. Arrays look like tuples at first. There's not much difference. You use square brackets instead of parentheses. One fundamental difference with an array, every value inside of the array has to be the same type. So we can't use a mixture here of floating point and integers. So let's make this dot two. And now we have our array of floating point numbers. So the type is with square brackets, the type of the individual element of the array, a semicolon, and then the number of elements in the array. And we want to say the array in this case. So you can see I have another problem here. We don't index into arrays the same way we do with tuples. It actually gives us a hint there. Instead of using dot zero, we want to put zero in square brackets. Let's do the same thing with y. And we can say that it works. Okay, let's get into one of the more complicated types in Rust, which is the structure. Structures are usually named and they're declared with the struct keyword. So let's make a struct. Let's call it something like secrets. And we're going to store some secrets in here. So a struct is basically a collection of values that can have different types. So just to keep things simple, let's just take our X and Y and declare them as inside of a structure. X is an F64 and Y is an I32. Let's try printing like we did before. Struct is, you can see here, I haven't actually made a value X and Y for secrets. So the way we do this is we have to say let X and Y equal, repeat the name of the struct secrets, and then we're going to leverage a little bit of help from Rust Analyzer. If we put our cursor on top of secrets and hit control dot and hit enter, fill struct fields, it gives us a place to put our different variables. So X is going to be 42.1, Y is going to be negative 69, semicolon. Okay, struct is more complicated to print out. We actually get a hint from the Rust analyzer. We can add a derived debug, and I'll explain what this is in future videos. But suffice to say, this is, sorry, I got that wrong. That's derive. This is inserting extra code to allow the debug formatting of our structure. And then last but not least, you can't use the indexer into secrets to get to members. We're going back to somewhat like the tuple syntax, but instead of dot zero, you can see that the elements of the structure actually have names now. So it would be dot X and dot Y. Running that program, we see it still works. Another type we're going to be using quite frequently in Rust is called the enum or enumerated value type. So let's declare one. This is what it looks like. You might have seen this in other programming languages. So we want to have a value that can be one of three different possibilities. Apple, banana, strawberry. And we'll say let some fruit equal fruit apple. You can see with the inlay hint that it knows it's of type fruit. Think of an enum as 
a type where the value can have one of the different variants declared for the enum. So it's a list of possibilities and any value is one of those possibilities. Now you might have noticed these yellow squigglies. We haven't seen these before too much. These are warnings from the compiler, basically telling us that we've declared this enum that has three possibilities, but we never use two of them. They're considered dead code. So one way to solve this would be simply to delete those two possibilities, right? Another possibility is to tell the compiler to hush up about this warning. So you can see here, this warn dead code is on by default. To turn it off, we would simply place that and turn a warn into an allow. With this other warning, it's saying that we never use that variable some fruit, so we could either print it or we could just say, don't warn us about the fact that the variable's unused. Allow unused variables. Okay, in the last video, if you remember, I made functions and I talked about what functions are. Functions actually have their own types as well. So we have a function that says something like, say hello, and it has the traditional print line, hello world in it. And we say, let func equals say hello. You can see with the inlay hint, it has a special type which looks like the function declaration. fn, say hello, the same parentheses there. This is technically the type of the function. func is now technically a value which refers to the function. So we can in fact use it as if it was the function say hello. And when we run the program at the end of the printout, it'll say hello world again. Now here's one type I want to cover that's a little bit weird, but it's pretty common. If you had a variable of nothing, and you use an empty tuple. This is actually legal. What it means is it's a variable or a value that basically is nothing. In other languages, you might think of it as a void. In this case, it has zero bits to store. The compiler is going to essentially drop the variable when it compiles the program, so it actually it has no memory. We use this type a lot in situations where a type is required, but at, when we run the program, there actually is no data. So a concept that goes along with types in Rust is the concept of alias. If you remember the last video, you can make an alias for a name in another module. Turns out you can do the same thing with types in Rust. So we have our type fruit up there. We can say type food equals fruit. This defines food to be an alias for fruit. So we could have say, let some food equal, put food in front and food works as a substitute for fruit. Now there's a whole lot more to get into with types when we use it in interactions between values and functions and that sort of thing, but let's wait to cover that in future videos. I just wanted to give you a run through of the various built-in types, the various constructions you can make with structures and enumerations. In the next video, we're going to explore a little bit more of types as they work with functions because as I promised to show you from previous videos, there's more to these empty parentheses than I've gotten to yet so far. So I hope you like this video and I hope you continue watching this series and that you're learning more and more about Rust as we go.